What's up motivators? My name is Taryn and I remember the very first time that I started running. It was painful. I could only run the length of a house at one time. I started getting pain in the side of my knees. I thought that I wasn't built for running. I thought that I'd never be able to actually enter a race. Fast forward to today, I've completed Ironmans, half marathons. I run several times a week. I've largely been able to avoid injuries for 12 years. And with everything that I've learned, I've put together this complete beginner's guide to getting started running. Now, if you are listening in podcast format, there is also the Terran's Motive Method YouTube channel that you can watch everything and get a visual on what we're going to talk about with this exact podcast information. If you're watching on YouTube and you wanna to listen to this in a podcast format, so that you can save a little bit of time and do it as a bit of a second task, you can go to the Terran's Motive Method podcast and consume this. But we have put together this complete beginner's guide for running that is going to cover technique because that's where I feel the most amount of problems can occur for a beginner runner. This is going to cover gear. That's often where beginner runners end up having questions at the start. We're then going to get into how do you build up to running more regularly and doing so in a safe manner. We're then going to get into a race plan because a lot of people they want to start running because they want to then get into a race so how does a race plan actually look if you want to build up to a 5k or a 10k we're going to get into injury avoidance and how to make sure that what you're doing is done safely so that you can continue running continue being fit for years to come we're going to get into nutrition advice because a lot of people wonder why their gut might hurt when they start running or why they run out of energy. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about motivation. What happens when you don't feel like running? Should you actually listen to that feeling of not feeling like running or should you push through it? Because there's a lot of things that are talked about on both sides of how to deal with motivation that I think are completely incorrect that might be doing you a disservice. And then finally, we're going to talk about weight loss because a lot of people get into running because they want to lose weight. And this is a perfectly good reason to take up running, but I think it's a little bit putting the shoe before the runner, if you know what I mean. So sit back, chill out, watch or listen to this, and whether you are a complete beginner runner, never having done anything before, or you're coming from another sport still being very fit, I think you're going to find a lot of benefit in this guide that we've put together for you. Let's start off with technique. I remember when I first started running, I would say to a lot of people, I'm not built to be a runner. I'm still not built to be a runner. I'm five foot eight, about 175 pounds. I have a 30 inch inseam. I'm very stocky and wide and thick. When I go in to get DEXA scans, I have like three extra pounds of bone mass. I'm literally big boned. I am like off the charts in how dense my bones are, which is really good for not getting a broken hip as I get older, but it's not very good for being a runner. That said, I've still been able to put out some races that I have been top 20 in an entire province of several thousand runners. I have put out runs in triathlons where I've been in the top 10% of run splits out there. This isn't because I magically found out how to be built like a runner, it's because I found a technique that is accessible to every single person that is efficient, that is smooth, that reduces injury, that reduces your heart rate so it's not so hard to run. And we're going to talk about that technique. So for the podcast listeners, we do have a visual of running technique that is on the screen on the YouTube channel, so you can go over and look for that. But we will explain it in a way here that you will be able to understand it. One of the big things that has to be understood with running technique is where you land. There is a lot of misconception about your foot strike and the style of foot strike that is just completely incorrect. A lot of the things that are said about running is that you have to run on your mid or your forefoot, landing on the ball of your foot at the front of the foot or the middle of the foot, and that you can't and shouldn't run on your heel. That's not quite correct. I have a video here from my younger and thinnest possible days of when I was running and the image is directly from the side. I'm drawing a line from my shoulder straight down vertically 
to where I'm landing on a treadmill. Now you should know that when you land on a treadmill, you will tend to land a little bit out front because that feels a little bit more natural. When you land directly in underneath you or behind you, you'll end up feeling like you're going to fall over. So this is going to give a little bit of a forward foot strike from where we're going to show. And that foot strike that I'm going to show you here is the key part. If you are watching, you'll see that the shoe first touches out front of directly underneath me. But if you look at how my body is positioned, I haven't really loaded a lot onto that foot. But if we go forward one frame where I put the load on my body is where the foot is directly underneath me. So this is called a heel kiss. It doesn't really matter if you land and just touch your foot out front of your center of mass. It doesn't really matter if your foot first contacts the ground out front of you as long as you're not loading onto it when it's out front of you. So what you can see if you're watching this is I will touch the ground out front and then I will gradually load onto the foot and it doesn't load and bear all the weight until it's directly underneath me. That is the most important part of running technique. You don't want to land out front of your body because that's putting on the brakes. And when you're doing that, you are actually going to transfer all of that energy that you are hitting the ground with up into your musculoskeletal system. It's going to be really hard on your body to actually absorb that. So we're going to give techniques on how you can actually do that in a bit. But that's point one. Second point in that is we want a gentle forward lean and the forward lean is from the ankle. What a lot of beginner runners do is they make that forward lean from the waist. They will bend over and you'll see a bit of a slouch forward that is directly from the waist. If you're watching this, you're going to be able to see that from my shoulder down to my hip and then down to the foot is basically a straight line up and down when I'm loaded. What you don't want to do is bend over at the waist. You want to bend from your ankles. That is really key. So you're landing underneath your center of gravity, underneath your hips, and then bending over from the ankles with the rest of your body basically just as flat as a board. The next thing that I want to show you is moving in a straight line. A lot of beginner runners will cross over with their feet or with their arms. They will cross over their center line and then kind of kick inwards, point their toe inwards, or they'll flare their toe way out on the way back, essentially you want to get your knee and your ankle tracking in as straight a line as possible. How you do that is not actually by concentrating on your lower body, you do that by concentrating on your upper body. And if you are able to keep your upper body and your arms from crossing over, and you do this by just keeping a 90 degree bend in your arm, having your arms at your sides in a relaxed position, and then making sure that you are moving just lightly inward, not crossing over your center line, that's going to help your legs track in a really straight motion. Keep your shoulders more or less pointing straight forward, your hips more or less pointing straight forward. Let your body move naturally side to side, but don't punch across your body and don't kick across your body. That alone is basic running technique. Related to this is a question of should you land on your forefoot, your midfoot, or your heel? It's all kind of wrapped into one. The dogmatic approach that a lot of natural runners or barefoot runners say is that you have to run on your mid or your forefoot. That's the only way to do it. And if you see kids running in fields, that that's how they're going to run. But kids are running in fields barefoot. People are running in shoes on pavement 90% of the time. 
Let's take the barefoot runners out of the equation because if you talk to any podiatrist or physiotherapist, they will tell you that people that run barefoot have an astronomically higher degree of injury rate. So we don't really want to do that. Humans are built to walk around barefoot. We're not really built to run long distances barefoot, especially on concrete. Concrete didn't exist when we were evolving. So we aren't evolved to run for long distances on concrete, which is where most people run. So when we look at this study here, and if you're in YouTube or on the podcast, whether it's the podcast notes or the YouTube description below, we'll have links to all of the studies and links to all of the pages that we mentioned in the description and in the show notes. This study called rear foot striking runners are more economical than midfoot strikers. Basically what this study showed is that once you get into a very, very fast running stride, like four minutes per kilometer or faster, it is more economical. You'll use less energy if you are running on your mid or your forefoot, on the balls of your feet. That's what you see track athletes do, where they're just prancing around the track on the balls of their feet. But when you get into more common running techniques, but when you get into more common running paces, what you see is it's actually more economical to land on your heel first, and then roll gradually onto the ball of your foot. It's gonna be most economical. You're gonna use the least amount of energy if you land on your heel and then gradually roll onto your midfoot or forefoot. That's what shoes are designed to do and that's what we are going to save the most amount of energy if we do. That said, use whatever feels natural to you. Just don't stress out if somebody says, hey, you should really be landing on your forefoot or your midfoot. That's not the case. For most of us, whatever is our most comfortable way of running, that's gonna be the most economical for us. So the technique cues that you really have to focus on for running technique is landing directly underneath you. You need to lean forward from the ankles and you need to reduce cross body motion. How do you start doing this? you can start with small drills that are very, very simple to do. How you develop this running technique is really simple. You just stand in place, jump up and down in place, and you're going to find that you will land directly under your center of gravity. Then add in some butt kicks. Again, you're going to find that you kick your butt and then you drop down and land under your center of gravity. If you then just start leaning forward from the ankles, this is going to be good running form. Simple as that. So what we recommend beginner runners do is that on their runs, you stop every three to five minutes, perform this drill of jumping up and down in place, kicking your butt, and then starting to lean forward. And it's going to remind you over and over what good running form feels like so that when you're running, you can think, all right, how do I need to feel the run so that I'm landing under my center of mass, so I'm leaning forward from the ankles and reducing cross body motion. Do that drill once every three to five minutes, you're going to have excellent running technique. Next, let's get into gear. A lot of new runners will say something like, I can't start running yet because I don't have the right gear. Again, this is BS. You can start running with whatever you've got. It doesn't take a whole lot of gear to get running really, really well. There are three areas that I think we do need to touch on for beginner runners to understand what good gear is and what bad gear is and what a bad way to approach some of the gear is. It's primarily regarding shoes, electronic devices, and treadmills. And we'll go through each one of these. Shoes are about as controversial a topic as religion. Like there have literally been fights about minimal shoes or Vibram shoes or barefoot shoes or running in sandals. But then there's the maximal shoes, the super cushion shoes, the hokas. Then there's the super shoes that are enhanced by carbon plates. It's so convoluted with what the messaging is from all the shoe companies that are saying you need over pronation shoes, under pronation shoes, stability shoes, you need now barefoot shoes, you need maximal cushioning shoes. It's no wonder that people are confused with what to do and then often go into a running store and those running stores are again incentivized to sell you on their process of getting you in your absolute ideal shoe for being an over or under pronator and it really comes down to getting you into a shoe that allows you to run in your natural biomechanical ability. 
What is your natural running form? What are those shoes? We actually have studies that have proven what those shoes are and it's not what most of the companies, be it running shoe companies or the running shoe store companies will tell you. There's one study here that looked at the influence of a big heel to toe drop, like a big difference in the amount of cushioning under your heel versus the cushioning that's under your forefoot. And what they found is that the less heel to toe drop there is for the beginner runners, the less likely it was that there was going to be injury for those runners. That's because the foot is able to move in its natural range of motion without having that big built up heel. So look for a shoe that's six millimeters or less for heel to toe drop. The next thing that is really common is foot orthotics. Even orthopedic surgeons and podiatrists will recommend orthotics. I really don't know why. This study here that looked at orthotics and insoles in running shoes and how much energy athletes used when they were running, it just found very clearly that you use way more energy so you're not actually working as efficiently as you should be when you have orthotics or insoles. I've gone through some small running injuries where I've been to a podiatrist myself where they have prescribed insoles. Then I go to a physiotherapist and the physiotherapist says, well, has your injury got better with these orthotics? And the answer was no. And they went, well, typically what's going to happen from a podiatrist is they're going to give you a pair of orthotics or insoles and then it's going to be built up a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more every single year because that orthotic and the insole, it's a crutch for what's actually causing the injury. I recommend going to a physiotherapist and finding where your weaknesses and imbalances are so that you can improve those and actually become a better runner as opposed to just putting an insole band-aid into your shoe. The next thing is how heavy should a shoe be? And this study called the influence of shoe mass on performance and running economy in trained runners found that the heavier the shoe, the more energy that you used. So I'd recommend a shoe that's about seven to 10 ounces. This is the sweet spot of being nicely cushioned while not being overly cumbersome to slog around in. Finally, this last study, maximal running shoes may increase injury risk to some runners, found that beginner runners, when they used big, big built up shoes, this actually resulted in a higher likelihood of injury risk. This covers people who are overweight or who are new to running all across the board, generally speaking, if you're a beginner runner, what you want to do is have a seven to 10 ounce shoe with a six millimeter or less heel to toe drop that has enough room in the front of the toe box to let your toes move freely and not have insoles in them. If you can do that, you don't need to focus on stability shoes or overpronating shoes or anything like that. Get a neutral shoe and this is going to allow your body to move as naturally as possible. Yes, it might mean that there's a little bit of pain up front, but that's what running is. We can't expect to hit cement 15,000 times with seven to 10 times our actual body weight and expect it to not hurt at the outset. So if it starts hurting, that's when you go to a running trained physiotherapist who is going to help you actually become a better runner by making you strong and fixing your weaknesses. Next, let's get into devices, being watches, heart rate monitors, maybe some foot pods. There's all kinds of devices that runners and endurance athletes can use. And a lot of it I would say is unnecessary. When you're just starting running, literally just learning to run, don't worry about tracking your pace or your cadence or your heart rate. For the first six to eight weeks, really all that you're looking to do is just start running. Get that nice pair of shoes that is going to allow you to move naturally and then just forget about everything else. As long as you got a shirt and a pair of shorts and a good set of shoes, you can go and run. But if you get past that first six to eight weeks of running and then you want to continue, I very quickly recommend that you get a watch with a heart rate monitor in a chest strap form. I definitely don't recommend getting a watch that has a built-in heart rate monitor and relying on that because that is not going to be accurate. I've done runs where at an easy pace, my heart rate has been at 185 beats per minute when I've actually measured it and known that it's been 135 beats per minute. That is wildly off. 
The wrist-based heart rate monitor is really only good for if you're walking around or you're doing strength training or cycling. That's about it. When it comes to jostling around in a run, it's just not accurate. So I recommend getting a heart rate monitor that is a chest strap. If you're wondering what watch to get, just go to DC Rainmaker's website. He has an excellent website where he reviews all different watches, all different heart rate monitors. Personally, I've used Garmin and Wahoo in the past, and those are the two brands that I really like. But I know Polar, Sunto, uh, Koros, they're all excellent watches. If you really want to dive into the data of which watch that you should get, just go to the DC Rainmaker website where you can see reviews on just about everything. One final note on gear comes to treadmills. Quite often when new runners start running, they think that they should be doing all of their running in a treadmill. It's just easier for them. They think, I will go to a gym, I'll run on a treadmill, that's where I'll learn to run. Good in theory, and I don't mind athletes using a treadmill because it is a good controlled environment. You know that you don't have a whole lot of side to side movement, which is fine for getting started running, but you don't wanna do all of your running on a treadmill. You want to be able to do some running on a treadmill, running ideally in trails, which gives you some of that side to side movement, that proprioception, that lateral stability, that's going to be a little bit softer on your joints and actually reduce the likelihood of injury if you can run primarily in trails and then even on cement for some of the speed work. Running on a treadmill tends to create an up and down bounce that just really isn't natural. You can kind of float over a treadmill. It's also a little bit sticky when you land and have a foot strike. So it's not the exact most natural running stride that you're actually going to do. When talking to physiotherapists again, what a lot of them say is if athletes run a pile over the winter in just a treadmill setting, a lot of the time when they go out and into the real world and then have to step down from a curb during a run, that's where an injury happens. Like really, really common because the treadmill just isn't dynamic enough to train your body in more than one really narrow range of motion. So do some running on the treadmill, but also make sure that you get outside. And in a perfect scenario, get out into trails. It's much, much better for you. I wanna take a quick second to thank our first sponsor being Athletic Greens with their product AG1. Now, this product is something that I use every single day and I've been doing so for about a year because I wanted to replace traditional multivitamins. Traditional multivitamins, they essentially just turn your pee bright yellow and you're flushing money down the drain. In the case of AG1, it's made with 75 whole food ingredients, so you're getting vitamins, minerals, nutrients that your body can actually absorb. I know for a fact that my body is absorbing it because my pee and everything else that goes on in the bathroom isn't just bright yellow. It's very easy for your body to assimilate and actually use. So if you wanna try Athletic Greens to make it easy, Athletic Greens will give you a free year's supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packages with your first purchase of Athletic Greens. All you have to do is go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Taryn Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Taryn to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So check that out, Athletic Greens, I'm a big fan. Let's get into then building up. If you're ready to start running, how do you actually start running and building up? A lot of people will say that they need a plan to get started. And I actually don't think that this is BS. I think that this is accurate that People should get a plan with some structure for how to build up safely. Now, whether you use a just learn to run program that you've downloaded online or maybe a couch to 5K, I think those are both adequate for teaching people how to run continuously for 50 minutes, but I don't think that they teach people how to run well for 30 to 50 minutes. I think they just get people slogging along and just grinding through running. The plan that we're going to share with you here is six weeks long, it's four runs per week, and they alleviate some of the challenges with those standard learn to run programs, and they get you running really well. So if you're listening via podcast, what we've got on screen here is a six week program with four runs per week. The first run on week one is six times one minute jog, three minute walk. And that's very standard for a lot of learn to run plants. So run number one and run number three in a week are a walk jog. The walk jog is excellent. There've actually been some really elite triathletes that use 
walk jogs for a lot of runs to keep their heart rate low and make sure that they can execute good running when they're actually running. So there's no shame in doing a walk jog. I've known people that have actually gone through world championships doing a walk jog. Be cool with a walk jog. It is how you're going to learn how to run really well. So run number one in week one is six times one minute jog, three minute walk, a 24 minute session. Run number three is seven times one minute jog, three minute walk, so a 28 minute session. We're gonna skip into week two and describe these walk jogs now. So run number one in week two is 90 seconds jog, two and a half minutes walk. We're still looking at a 24 minute workout. Run number three is seven times 90 seconds jog, two and a half minutes walk. And the rest of the six weeks go in this pattern where every single week we are adding 30 seconds to the jogging and reducing 30 seconds from the walking. We're doing 24 minutes in run number one and 28 minutes in run number two. And in the end, you finish with run number three being seven times three and a half minutes jog, 30 seconds walk. This is literally how I learned how to run. I would have to walk three houses and then jog one house and then walk two houses and then jog two houses. And I would just measure it out not by seconds, but by houses. So what you're looking to do is just gradually increase the amount of running, gradually decrease the amount of walking. Runs number two and four are where I think that we can eliminate some of the issues that come from the traditional learn to run programs. Run number two is something that I'm gonna focus on now. Run number two in a week starts in week one with five times 10 seconds sprinting. When I say sprinting, I mean sprinting as fast as you can go. This is going to open up some neuromuscular firing in your body that is probably turned off. Most adult amateur runners get sloggy and slow and don't know how to move fast because we don't move fast. So our really fast twitch muscle fibers aren't able to fire. We're not able to recruit a lot of muscle groups. By doing these 10 second sprints that build up to 20 second sprints, you're going to recruit a whole lot of muscle fibers and turn on a lot of neuromuscular connections that is going to train your body to be able to run fast and well, as opposed to running with poor neuromuscular firing and not a lot of muscle groups. By having all those neuromuscular connections turned on between the brain and the body, and as many muscle groups as possible turned on, this is going to allow you to run really well and really fast. You're not going to peak at a very slow slog like a lot of those learn to run training programs end up doing. So in run number two, we start with five times 10 seconds and then go six times 10 seconds, seven times 10 seconds, eight times 10 seconds in week four, and then six times 15 seconds in week five, six times 20 seconds in week six. And this means you are going all out during the sprint and you are backing off, walking, just hanging out, standing around, waiting to catch your breath to do the next sprint. So as long as that takes is what it takes. There is no definite pattern of like, well, do 10 seconds of sprinting and then 50 seconds of rest. Just take however long it takes to get fully primed up for the next sprint. Run number four in this building up program is actually a strong hike. Now, a lot of people will say, well, hey, like, you know, if I'm walking, I'm not actually learning to run. I would disagree. If you went and did a eight kilometer walk right now, I guarantee that you would be really tired. Myself right now, 12 years after taking up triathlon and endurance sports, I went for a 6K walk the other day and I was sore by the end of it. The reason that I'm sore and I believe in a strong hike is because you're spending so much time on the ground when you're walking. You're not running where you're just sprinting off the ground and bouncing from one foot to the next with really short ground contact time. You're spending a lot of time on the ground. So your body is forced to bear a lot of weight. That's what we're trying to train our body to do. And doing this on a hike where you have lateral side to side stability, it's going to turn on again a lot of stabilizer muscles and it's going to train your body to stay upright for a long period of time. So you're not going to get as sore as often. 
So in run number four, we start with a 30 minute strong hike. And when I say strong, it should feel like you're working. It should feel like you're breathing heavy, like your heart rate is up. This is what we want you to get into. This is going to get into that zone of training where you are building a lot of mitochondria because you're working fairly hard. Mitochondria are the energy producers of our muscles and the more we have, the easier it's going to be. And if you can get into that nice high zone two, like that steady hike kind of effort where you're breathing fairly heavy, you're gonna be building a lot of mitochondria. You're gonna be building the ability to stay upright for a long period of time. It's gonna be excellent training that is gonna transfer into your running. So we're starting off in week one with a 30 minute strong hike. Then we do week two, a 35 minute strong hike. Week three, a 40 minute strong hike. Week four, we do a 40 minute strong hike again, but I want you to jog for five continuous minutes at the end. Week five, 40 minutes of strong hiking again, but a seven minute jog at the end. And then run number four in the very final sixth week, a 40 minute strong hike with a 10 minute jog at the end. After those six weeks, I guarantee that you would be able to go out and run continuously for 30 minutes because you've basically done it already, which really isn't that much in all of these workouts at this point. So you can definitely go and enter a race. That's where we're gonna go with the next part of this. When it comes to thinking about doing a race, a lot of people say, no, 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 I could never do that. I could never do a 5K race. I could never do a 10K race. I could never do a marathon. I believe that myself. I thought I was never going to be built for running, that I would always be injured, that I would always feel bad, but no, I think that once you get that basic buildup of the six weeks, the world's your oyster and you can go and build up to any run that you want. You can set any goal that you want. It's just, are you willing to put in the time and do you have a good plan to support you? That's what we've created here that we're going to share with you. If you're listening to this by podcast, I'm showing a blog post that is on mymotive.com that is a how much to train calculator that we've created. What you can do with this calculator is you can put in, whether it's a triathlon, a running race, a cycling race, a duathlon, a swim run, any endurance event that you want, indicate what your background is. So whether you have no background whatsoever in fitness or you have a modest background, which is really an unrelated background, like maybe you're fit, but it's in MMA, so not necessarily endurance sports, or you have an elite background being you're very, very talented and already really good at endurance sports, and then what your goal is. So do you just wanna finish the race, or do you wanna finish feeling strong, or do you wanna compete? And then by putting in what your background and your goals and your race is, we get an indication of how long it'll take you to actually train for the race, being how many months of good training it'll take you and how many weekly hours of good training it'll take you. So most people think about starting their first race doing a 5K. So for people with no background looking to just finish a 5K, it's gonna take you about two months after you've gone through that Learn to Run program and only about two to three hours of training. If you wanna finish feeling strong, it's gonna take you about four months and about four to five hours of training. If you wanna compete, it might take you about 12 months and five to six hours a week of weekly training. If you have a modest background and you just wanna finish, we're talking one month of training, two to three hours a week. If you wanna finish feeling strong, it's gonna take you about three months and four to five hours a week. If you want to compete and you have a modest background, it's gonna take you about nine months and five to six hours a week. Let's say you have an elite background and you just wanna finish, well, you know, zero months. You can do it right away. If you wanna finish feeling strong, one month, I would say, to finish that 5K. And if you have an elite background, only about six months of five to six hours a week of training and you'll do really well. How does that training week look? What does a training plan look like? Well, we can go over to our training app and actually show you what a training week would look like. So if you're listening, we're here in the motive training plan where you can go in and add any endurance race you want and you'll get a plan for it. And you can actually guide that plan to dictate how much you want to train. So whether you want to train 
the house down and do as much training as possible, or you just wanna finish the race, we've got a plan for you. What we're going to do is we're just going to add a 5K race and we're going to put it several months out because remembering that calculator that on average about three to four months from starting from scratch is about right. So we'll add it as a 5K because that's typically where most people start. And then in our app, we have this slider where you can go down to as little training hours, down to two average training hours, or up to five if you wanna head for the podium training hours. And you can see how your plan changes. Let's go with somebody who wants to finish feeling strong. So somewhere around four to six months of training, and you'll be able to get across that finish line feeling like you were in control of the race and it wasn't in control of you. At that level, we're looking around four and a quarter hours of training per week, and it's just four workouts. It's one main run, this is a low intensity run that you're going at just general talking pace. It's one low intensity run and it's done at low, just general talking pace. We have this as anywhere from around 60 minutes to an hour and a half. We want you to build up gradually from that point at which you finish the Learn to Run program so that you can run for about 60 minutes. This is going to allow you to definitely run a 5K, a 10K, because the duration that you're able to run being 60 to 90 minutes is really, really easy for you. And then dropping down to a 5K or a 10K, again, super easy. So the distance becomes completely irrelevant. We also have a Thursday run that is a steady run. So these are longer intervals of about four to 15 minutes. And then we have an intense run. These are really short bursts. These are 15 second hill sprints or one minute intervals, like a really sharp, intense run. We have that on Tuesday. And then we have a strength session of about 30 minutes on Saturday. So if you are listening to this by podcast, we have a run on Tuesday that's intense, a run on Thursday that's steady, and then a long run Sunday, just three runs per week, one strength session. It's worth noting that we've spaced out the run so that you're not running on back-to-back -back days. That's something that you wanna build up towards doing. And you want to, whenever possible, not run on back-to-back -back days because you don't wanna bring fatigue into a run that's very likely to lead to injury. We wanna make sure that we include strength training into this so that you can withstand all the pounding of all of that running and you're not going to be developing injuries at quite the same rate. We'll discuss that in the injury section coming up right away. So that's planning for a race. When it comes to injury avoidance, a lot of people say, well, every time I start to run, I get injured. I was that guy, I was very, very much that guy. I had all of the common running injuries. And again, it wasn't that I was just running, it was that I was running with bad technique, which we've gone over, and that my body wasn't used to actually running. This is super common. This is actually what I would expect if you're just learning to run. The reason for this is most of us spend the vast majority of our time sitting down, so that shortens our hip flexors in the front of our body and then it kind of turns off a lot of our stabilizer muscles in our glutes. So every time we hit the ground with that pounding, our body isn't really able to absorb and stabilize all of that force, which is upwards of seven to eight times your body weight. So you've gotta be really strong to be able to withstand that. That said, there are some really quick things that you can do to strengthen the certain areas of your body that just are extremely common to get injured and the painful areas that most people experience when they start running. There are four main areas that people experience pain. First being shin splints, second being lower back pain, third being runner's knee, that's pain on the outside of the knee, and then the fourth being foot pain. Really quickly, we can fix a lot of these with some very basic movements that you do over the course of about two to three months a lot of the pain that you'll experience as you're building up running will very quickly go away. First is shin splints. What you wanna to do to avoid shin splints is loosen up your calves with some calf stretching and some side to side movement so that you aren't just flexible in one direction, forward and backward with your calves, that you are flexible from side to side in your calves. 
You also want to strengthen your shins, and you can do this while you're sitting at a desk, wrapping an elastic band around the edge of your desk, and then pulling your toe towards you. This is going to strengthen your shin. I had to do this for just one period of time for a grand total of about three to four weeks when I started learning to run, and I haven't had shin splints since. Lower back pain. This is often because of that pounding in the side to side movement where your core isn't stable enough to actually stabilize itself. In the strength sessions that we recommend in our app, we do almost all of our strength training with kettlebells. And the reason for that is because a kettlebell pulls you off to the side. The center of gravity and mass from that kettlebell is not in the center where your hand is, it's pulling you over to the side. So that pulling over to the side forces your body to stabilize. So just learning how to use kettlebells and strengthening the side stabilizer muscles, the side glutes in your body are going to alleviate huge amounts of lower back pain for a lot of you. The third issue is runner's knee being that sharp pain in the side of the knee. I remember the first time that I got this, I thought that my running career was over. It was so painful. I'll still get it now, even 12 years later, and I can fix it just about instantly. Most commonly, it's because of really tight IT bands, and you can fix this by rolling out the side of your bum with a foam roller or a softball or a trigger point ball, and then rolling along the side of your IT band and just focusing on relaxing, just relax. Don't sit and avoid it and clench and tense up. You wanna just let go and relax. And that's going to really release a lot of that tightness. In my case, when I started experiencing runner's knee, I can fix it in like one session of just letting everything go on a foam roller. And then the fourth and final thing that you need to focus on is foot pain. This is very, very common. It's the first thing that hits the ground. It absorbs the absolute most amount of force in our entire body. It's the thing that gets beat up over and over. I like to have just a very simple foot care routine. It's that calf stretching, rolling on each side of the calf, so bending over and then gradually moving from side to side so that you can release all different areas around the lower leg having a foot rolling routine. So before every single run and after every single run, I'll put my foot on a trigger point ball and just work everything out. That's going to release some of the muscles. And then I do like to have a routine where if I'm feeling like I'm extra beat up and I'm running a lot, I'll go and every single morning, I'll do 20 steps forward, 20 steps backward on the outside of my feet, on the inside of my feet, on my tippy toes, and then on my heels. And this is helping strengthen my feet. Do those few things and you're going to avoid a huge amount of all of the running injuries that are super common to everyone. Of course, running injuries are going to pop up. Running is like the Cracker Jack box of injuries. You never know what you're going to get. And the rule of thumb is that if you have an injury that over three weeks hasn't fixed itself, go see a running specific physiotherapist. They're going to help you out. One final note on injury avoidance is a lot of people will say, well, what about stretching? Should I stretch a bunch before my run? The data show that doing that static stretch of 20 to 30 seconds before a run and then going out and doing a run is actually more likely to lead to injury than if you had just gone out cold. As opposed to doing static stretching, I recommend doing dynamic stretching, which is more like active movement. So you're just moving through a stretch for about a second, holding it for a second and moving through onto the next stretch or the other side. That tends to work a lot better than static stretching for avoiding injury. Finally, the last little thing that I want to share about injuries is there's one study called Injuries in Runners, a systematic review on risk factors and sex differences. Big, big study looking at all the data on everything that contributed to running injuries. And it's a really long study to read. You can go and check it out, but I'll summarize it for you. The main takeaways is that previous use of orthotics was a big risk factor for running injuries. Running on concrete more often than trails was a big risk factor. Wearing the same running shoes for longer than four months was a risk factor. Running shoes do wear out. As soon as you start noticing that your ankle and your foot starts feeling beat up, it's time to switch out your shoes. Running 50K or more per week, that's where there was a big tipping point into more running injuries. 
primarily participation in non-axial sports, so sports where you are just going in one direction and one movement pattern. That's why we like kettlebells, that's why we like trail running, because it's more dynamic, it's a little bit more side to side. On the other end of things, running only once per week, that was a big indication of higher likelihood of running injuries because it just wasn't enough for your body to learn how to run and then running too much too soon. So that's where we have that learn to run build up program that we gave you. And we are so, so concerned with developing really good run training plans in our app to make sure that it's a gradual build up as opposed to wham, here's a big increase. Next thing I wanna get into nutrition for running. Quite often, you will see running clubs where people are walking around with basically their week's worth of groceries on their hip. This is so overblown, and I think it leads people to thinking that running nutrition is really complicated. This is natural because when a lot of people start running, their guts turn into just garbage. Again, this is very natural, and this is something that we can alleviate. There are two things and two schools of thought with running nutrition that I want to clear up for you. The first is that you need immense amounts of calories to make sure that you've got the energy to run. Very much not the case. Unless you're running for 75 minutes or more, in which case you're probably not watching this video, you don't need calories. Maybe just a little bit of liquid. The other is if you find that you're running and your stomach gets upset, a lot of people will do fasted running. I've seen some surveys out there where people have seen as much as 60 to 65% of the runners out there are doing empty stomach runs because they just don't like the feeling of all of that stuff being in their stomach while they're running. I would caution you against both of these approaches. So I mentioned how unless you're running for 75 minutes or more, you really don't need nutrition. We'll talk about what to take for nutrition if you are running for 75 minutes or more in another podcast and another video. For now, just know that for the vast majority of 75 minute or less runs, you don't need any calories during that run but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have any before. There's a study here that I'm sharing called Exercise Training and Fasting Current Insights where they looked at a whole bunch of fasted exercise training and generally what they took away from it is that they don't recommend athletes do fasted training. I personally don't recommend that athletes do fasted training. There are two very valid reasons that people are specifically doing fasted training. One being that they want to burn more fat as fuel. Well, studies have shown that you burn no more fat as fuel if you do a fasted training session versus a training session where you just didn't have carbs beforehand or controlled your blood sugar beforehand. And the second reason that people want to do fasted training is because they think that it's going to result in more weight loss, which this study actually admits that it does, but it's a short term outcome. In my experience, what I have seen from the vast majority of athletes who do fasted training is that they aren't able to actually make progress. Their body isn't able to absorb all of that training, so they really just hit a glass ceiling and stop making progress very early on. Second is they actually get really hungry later in the day because they came into that session and actually didn't give their body any fuel. So the concept of losing a bunch of weight doing fasted training ends up actually being the reverse of what they want. They actually gain more weight. And then the final thing is when you are fasted, early in the morning, you wake up, your cortisol levels are high. Your stress hormones are really high because you haven't eaten throughout the entire night. And then if you go and layer on more stress with going and exercising, you're putting stress on top of stress and long-term chronic stress loads actually have been shown to increase the likelihood of people gaining weight. So we want to do two things. We want to eat before we work out to train our gut and have just a small little meal before that session so that you aren't overloading your gut with things that it has to slosh around and process and kind of stabilize but it is learning how to actually get through that run without pooping yourself. That's totally normal that you've got to learn that in the first couple of years of doing running. And then second, we don't want to deprive our bodies. For both reasons, definitely make sure that you are eating something before your training. 
This is a very good time to thank our sponsor, UCAN, which is the exclusive nutrition provider that I use. And I really like UCAN because it gets you a good access to carbs, but it is a specific type of carbohydrate that is UCAN super starch that creates really stable blood sugar. As opposed to traditional gels, chews, and bars, which fire up your blood sugar and then it crashes 15 minutes later, UCAN is designed so that your blood sugar rises really gradually and then tapers off so you get really, really long lasting energy. You can go to UCAN.co forward slash Taren to get an exact recommendation in a blog post that we put together with UCAN for how I use UCAN. And if you go and buy anything after going to UCAN.co forward slash Taren, you will get a discount applied at checkout. We're almost done here, but the next thing that I want to talk about is motivation. And certainly what motivation isn't is this guy. As much as I like David Goggins for telling people to get up off the couch and challenge themselves, the motivation message of just stay hard and run through pain and just be extreme and like don't let life get you down ever, ever, constantly fight through it and battle, that's a little bit extreme. And the reason for that is that low motivation is actually a really strong and important signal that we need to listen to. Quite often, it's the first reason that our body is telling us to say, hey, like, you know, maybe you should just calm down. That doesn't mean that we should always give into it. And the second our motivation gets low, that we should just give in and sit on the couch and not go and exercise. But we also shouldn't ignore all of the signals that our body is telling us. And really, high motivation does not trump a well-designed training plan. It never does. I think the two need to go hand in hand. And there's a three-step process that we like to use to make sure people are keeping their motivation levels high. First is to have a plan. If you don't have a plan that somebody else has given you, it's really easy to cop out because every single day you are going to get up and go, well, what should I do? Should I maybe do this? Should I go hard today? Should I not go hard today? Well, I don't feel great, so I probably shouldn't go hard. Okay, maybe I'll even just sit home. All of that time of deciding what to do every single day creates doubt. It's an opportunity for doubt to creep in. So if you've got a plan, that is just one area that is going to alleviate doubt. Second is you should have a scary goal in mind. And I say a scary goal as in something that if you were to do it tomorrow, you'd have a 50-50 shot of actually accomplishing it. This scary goal is going to motivate you because it's in the future and every single day when you go, well, my motivation is low, should I do it? Could I do it? Is it safe to do it? Or am I just being a sure. Well, you're gonna be able to suss that out because you've got this goal in mind. But if everything is telling you not to go and do that, I think you should listen to that. But that scary goal is probably gonna pull you a little bit more into the healthy motivation that you should do every day, as opposed to just blindly every single day saying, I have to go out and suffer and it doesn't matter how I feel. Finally, the third thing that you need to include is community. If you know that you have to go and show up to a group run or a group ride or a group strength session, or you have stated that you want to complete a race at some point in the future, you are going to be much more likely to actually accomplish that goal. So when you set that goal, state it to people. When you get that training plan, see if there are ways to include other people in that training plan. And that's going to make you much more likely to get through those moments of low motivation. The final message on all this is that if you are seeing consistently every single day low motivation for that first workout in the morning, or maybe you have a second workout later in the day and you really just can't get into it, listen to that and accept that that might be your brain saying, hey, it's time to either reduce the amount of training that you're doing or just taking a rest for a few days. That's not just okay, that's smart training. Finally, let's talk about weight loss and wrap it up with that. A lot of people will say, I'm getting into running to lose weight. I do think that this is kind of BS because at the outset of running, your goal shouldn't be weight loss because it's gonna be really hard for you to lose weight if you literally can't even run yet. Your goal in the first six to eight weeks should be getting proficient at running, and if you're able to do that, you're probably going to lose weight as a secondary benefit. 
but you might not because you're not really running that much. So it's okay to get into this and for the first six to eight weeks, not really see any improvements. If you get through that first six to eight weeks, you've gone through stage one. Then you can get into stage two, where you're thinking about specific speed training run plans, specific race training run plans, or specific weight loss training run plans. Ideally, a well-designed training plan will allow you to do everything, and that's what we focus on. So there are three things that I would recommend that you do in addition to having that good plan to make sure that your weight loss is continued. First is to eat lots. Make sure that you're eating beforehand so that you aren't getting cravings and overeating later in the day. If you are running longer than 75 minutes, make sure that you are taking on something at that point and then eat after and like a big meal after so that you are bookending and filling all of your exercise with nutrition so that your body isn't getting into a deprived state leading you to potentially overeating later in the day. Second is to do a lot of shh I'm just gonna say super high intensity interval training. There are lots and lots of studies about HIIT training, high intensity interval training versus super high intensity interval training. And consistently, what studies like this one that I'm showing here on screen, if you're watching, state that the super high intense intervals like 10 to 30 second intervals are much better for body composition. They lead to more weight loss and more fat loss. A lot of training plans tend to ignore this. In our training plans, we don't because I think that it's good for neuromuscular power, for top end speed, and for body composition. So it's good training and it's good for our health. And then the third thing is we want people to train a lot at a low intensity. Low intensity training is the fat burning zone. We're gonna talk all about zones in another session here, but the low intensity where you can talk, where you have no trouble breathing, that low intensity training zone is where you burn the most amount of fat. It peaks right around the top end of zone two, if you're familiar with the zone training system, and you wanna be able to burn as much fat as fuel as possible because that's going to make you really metabolically healthy, you're gonna process food better, you're gonna be able to exercise better, it's the low intensity training that allows you to do that. So that is it for today. Thank you for getting to the end of this video or this podcast, however you are consuming this. Whether you're watching or listening to this in the description below or in the podcast show notes, we'll have links to absolutely everything that we talked about to help you out. If you want to get a training plan that has all of this in mind, go to mymotive.com and you can try our training plan app for free for 14 days. And if you like it, it's just 57 bucks a month for unlimited training plans, unlimited changes, unlimited everything everything and it's completely designed for people who are the average everyday amateur endurance athlete. So thank you for listening or watching everyone. Go out there, run a lot, later motivators.